Good morning, everybody, and happy Friday. Welcome to the uh, Informatics Institute Friday Power Talk um, seminar series. I'm very happy to introduce today's speaker. He's very well known to me and many others of you. I can I know many of you have worked with him or know him. Um, Dr. Wayne Liang. He's Director of Informatics Education and Outreach at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, and he's a pediatric hematologist oncologist specializing in bone marrow transplants in the at the Aflac Cancer and Blood Disorder Center. And he's also assistant professor of pediatrics at Emory University School of Medicine. And uh, he completed his residency in pediatrics and was served as chief resident at Vanderbilt University. Uh, he completed his uh, fellow in um, pediatric hematology oncology at Seattle Children's and um, completed an NLM uh, National Library of Medicine postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Washington. Uh, and he was previously faculty of um, in, in the Informatics Institute and Pediatrics at UAB and attending physician at um, Children's uh, Children's of, Atlanta, of, of, of Alabama, and uh, I still miss you very much. And um, you know, you, you've really uh, you know does clinical informatics research and practice. Um, you know, is, has included in integrating genomics into clinical practice. Um, in his new role, he's focusing more on getting helping the uh, people on the front line. So focusing on EHR and uh, chart review, making chart review better, developing how to develop content to help everybody practice better. The name of his talk is Expanding Clinical Informatics Literacy and Workforce Capacity Through Provider Builder Programs. Great. Thank you, Amy, for that wonderful introduction. Um, yes, it's so I'm so glad to be um, among friends and to be visually, uh, virtually visiting you all in Birmingham, Alabama. And so um, I'm excited to give this talk. Um, and uh, first off, here are my disclosures. I provide consulting through Westat to, to the NCI. I'm advisor for a company called ChemoMap, and I am partially funded on an NCI grant um, supporting uh, development of uh, cancer uh, chemotherapy um, uh, uh, knowledge. Um, and my talk today has nothing to do with any of these um, disclosures. So here, I'd like to start with my take home point um, to tell you what I'm gonna tell you before I tell you. And so here are my take home points. Um, there's a need for informatics workforce development programs in order to achieve the vision of healthcare transformation. And I would like to posit that provider builder programs provide informatics literacy and EHR build tra skills training for non-expert clinicians, non-informaticist clinicians. Um, provider builders can serve as force multipliers for clinical informaticists, and a formal leadership program with FT support can increase clinician participation and program impact for such programs. Finally, if there is time, I will discuss provider builder maturity model um, that can be used to guide program development. Um, and we'll, I welcome any questions and discussion from the audience. Um, so I love to start with this slide, you know, first, Thing to think about is, you know, let's imagine when we say what the future of medicine looks like, we often have visions like this, you know, I, I do find graphics like these a little bit hokey, you know, where we have all these charts and graphs popping off the screen and we have holograms and whatnot. But um, more seriously, often when we think of, talk about healthcare transformation or what medicine should look like or is going to, we often think about data. We think about the better use of data to help us make better decisions for our patients better use of data for research, for discovery, um, better integration of different systems. And so there's often a component of data, there's a component of, um, of technology, there's a better component, there's you know, a vision of perhaps um, work, uh, working smarter rather than harder, um, addressing some of the um, burdens we currently face in the healthcare system. So just imagine, you know, when someone say future in medicine, what do you imagine? Um, and um, as what that looks like. But at the same time, there's, there's a challenge here. You know, you can get all futuristic to talk about what that future looks like. But the question is, are we actually ready? Are we actually moving the direction to achieve whatever that vision is? How much of that is um, just um, a vision, but not really well matched with reality? Because our current EHRs and our current data systems and our current processes and our current uh, workforce is not ready to help us achieve that vision that you may have in your mind. Um, this is a uh, screenshot from a famous uh, YouTube video by um, a physician comedian named ZDoc MD that I um, commend to all of you. I recommend to all of you check it out if you haven't seen it. Describing some of the challenges we have today 
with the use of our current tools, namely the EHR in taking care of patients. Uh, we are pretty far removed from this vision that we have of effective use of technology when there are basic problems that we struggle with. Um, here's some graphics um, of um, humorous graphics from Gomer blog, a um, comedic um, uh, website about medical practice, about the alert burden that you might um, experience in the EHR and everyday use, and some humorous um, articles um, that um, kind of illustrates the frustration existing clinicians have with our existing IT systems. Um, and sometimes you can't really tell how close to reality it is, and it strikes a nerve because it does help illustrate the problems we currently have in our current systems. So I kind of think it like this, you know, um, this uh, cute girl in a, a toy car, you know, very, very cute, but is she really ready to take that vehicle on an actual road, uh, let alone the interstate? Um, and I like to use this image to think about, you know, are we ready? Are we ready from a point of view of people? Do we have the human resources needed to achieve a small part of that vision which we're imagining? Do we have the processes in place, the governance in place, the, the, um, that we need to achieve that vision that we're working towards? And do we have the technology piece as well? Often in these type of conversations, we focus on the technology because technology is really interesting to us. You know, we talk about AI, we talk about machine learning and chat GBT, um, things like that. Um, but we're quite a ways off from real world implementation of this. For this talk, uh, instead of focusing on technology and process, I would like to focus on people. Do we have the people we need or do the people that we have, do they have the skills that they need to be, able to be able to achieve this vision of data-driven healthcare transformation. So here's the classic um, challenge that we face in informatics. On one hand, we have IT professionals. They have expertise in running IT systems. They can keep the EHR running. They have deep knowledge of its functionality. Um, and they have advanced certifications, things like that. But they may lack um, personal knowledge of the clinical workflow. Um, so sometimes the solutions that are developed are not well matched to the problem, or um, uh, that might be a challenge. For clinicians, clinicians who are seeing patients on the front lines, they have deep knowledge of their local clinical workflows and their local challenges, but they lack um, the informatics and data science expertise to be able to develop solutions. And even if they have ideas for solutions, they lack access. They don't have the ability to make changes um, directly in the system. Um, so, uh, you know, the answer is, well, clinical informaticists. Clinical informaticists have deep knowledge, um, training, maybe prior personal experience or work experience as a clinician. They understand clinical workflows. They also may have understanding of EHR capabilities. And they have informatics, data science expertise. So great. We need clinical informaticists done. We're, we're done with this, right? Um, but there's a challenge here. There's a short workforce uh, for shortage. Now, there are not great estimates for how many clinical informaticists that we need, but um, the best data I've, I saw in the literature, that was actually a couple of years old, is that there may be an estimate of a need of 6,000 to 13,000 uh, clinical informatics experts in the US health system. And the latest data for the number of board certified clinical informaticists as of January of last year is 2,313. That's pretty good for a young specialty, but we're only adding 220 individuals, uh, board certified individuals to the roles every year. So as you can see, the demand for experts in clinical informatics uh, far exceeds the supply and exceeds our the um, capacity of the current training systems to develop these individuals who have this expertise. So we have to be able to um, find a solution for this if we want to be able to achieve a small part of the vision that um, we were imagining in the beginning. So these numbers are from 2020, so it's a couple of years old. So this is a heat map of um, the number of clinical informatics subspecialists per 1,000 1, US active physicians. So darker means that there is more, um, you know, a higher density and lighter is, uh, you know, lower density. The national average for number of board certified clinical pharmacists is 2.2 per 1,000 physicians. That, that's from 2018. Our current number is closer to 2.4. But it's 
you can see it's still a pretty small progress. And I circled the areas in the country that are particularly um, low in the, the uh, density of, um, of, of concurrent informatics experts. And this is before you know, Informatics Institute um, development um, and growth for our programs, but there is clearly a shortage in the South, the deep South, the Southeast, there's a shortage of individuals. Uh, even with states where there are many informaticists, when compared to the number of physicians, is still small. For example, New York still considers um, relatively low, despite a major programs there, because there's just so many physicians there. So I would posit that um, in order to develop concrete informatics workforce, yes, we need more concrete informaticists, but we also need informatics and data science literacy programs, literacy training programs for all clinicians. Let's not think about just training new staff who are experts. Let's think about the people who are already here. The physicians, the nurses, the APP, the art respiratory therapists, the speech therapists, the, the clinicians who are already doing the work, who already know the local needs. Can we upskill them? Can we provide them with the skills that they need so that they can participate in healthcare data transformation? So I like to use the, uh, the world statistics as an analogy to what I'm describing. So as medical, I'm a physician, so I'll talk from the point of view of a physician. As a, as a physician, uh, uh, I had to take biostats before going to medical school because there's a recognition that all physicians need to be able to interpret a p-value. They need to be able to read the medical literature and understand what is happening in the literature so they can be able to uh, make decisions based on published research. That's everyone, all physicians. And you can say probably the same across many different health professions. And if you put a researcher there, same thing. All researchers need to have basic understanding of statistical uh, methods. Some physicians, some clinicians need to be able to be able to know the way around SAS or STATA to be able to do analysis on their own, you know, student t-tests, um, to be able to do ANOVA. Um, some people get more advanced than that, but I think that there's not all, but some for the day-to-day day -day job need to be able to do some basic analysis. And so they have some increased skills and uh, capabilities in this area. But very few physicians become statisticians. Some do, some um, you know, pursue a master's degree in clinical research, or MPH, they become master's level statisticians, they can do their own analysis now. They don't need a higher statistician, for example, to do the research design. But the number of physicians who are required to be experts in statistics is low. Informatics, I would say similar situation. All physicians, all nurses, all clinicians use the EHR. Um, all clinical researchers use tools like PubMed, which is an informatics tool. So everyone needs to have some literacy in the use of data or informatics products or tools. Some will benefit from advanced training, additional skills training, and to be able to develop basic data or informatics products and tools. And here I include things like decision support or clinical doc, uh, documentation templates. Um, some um, physicians would benefit or APPs would benefit in additional skills training in this area. But few are required, um, are needed to become informaticists to uh, pursue a fellowship pro uh, uh, training program or a master's degree or even a PhD. So for the rest of this talk, I'm going to be focusing on the uh, the average clinical user who are not becoming informaticists, but would like to develop additional skills and uh, uh, competencies in informatics and or data science. And so these individuals, um, they may be PhD oncologists, uh, they may be cardiologists, they may be an ICU physician. They have a deep knowledge of the clinical workflow. If you can take that deep knowledge and marry it with EHR capabilities, I understand how the EHR works now. I, I actually have some access um, and some um, to be able to, to make changes and make something new, then I can perhaps participate, um, drive forward that PDSA cycle in order to improve uh, quality of care, patient safety, process improvement, help me solve some problems I'm dealing with on the front lines. And that's the vision for this level of training. So UAB is an Oracle Cerner environment and uh, Children's of Alabama is an epic environment, or becoming an epic environment. So I would like to say that there are opportunities for this training in both Oracle world and um, Cerner world and the epic world. 
Now, the rest of my talk will focus on epic the accessible air space I, that I know better. I do know that physician architect programs are available. They're a little bit different in how they're constructed from the physician build, EPIC's physician builder program. But um, uh, if you have if you have questions about that, I can um, provide more details, but um, I don't have firsthand knowledge. I will talk about the EPIC program, um, particularly for our children's colleagues and um, uh, here on the call. So EPIC's Physician Builder Program is a training certificate program offered directly by EPIC uh, systems. Uh, it is for physicians and APPs. Unfortunately, they don't um, provide an opportunity for students, informatics students, or medical students to get trained on um, this pathway. Um, but um, I'm having conversations with them about that type of opportunity. So it's for anybody with an MD or DO or their APPs or APP equivalents. They're all eligible to take this program. Um, so uh, these are taught live um, virtually through Zoom, or you can go in person to, uh, to Epic in Wisconsin, and they're free of charge to Epic customers. So um, there's no fee for physicians and APPs. And once uh, individuals are certified, they can apply for local builder access at the hospital of where they work. Now, each hospital has their own governance policies for who can get access. So um, that's not guaranteed, but oftentimes the certification is a base level requirement to be able to apply for access. What does the curriculum cover? The basic three course curriculum for basic certification covers essential EHR build skills needed for a clinician to support clinical workflow. They cover things like building documentation templates. They do things, uh, teach you how to build order sets, how to build alerts, how to build patient list columns, um, you want this column to change color when this happens, things like that. Uh, reports, I want to have a report dedicated to the pediatric ICU. I want a report that gives me the, all the data I need before I see this patient in primary care clinic. You can build that report. And building logic um, rules within, uh, within Epic or your EHR to be able to do things for you, they teach you how to do this. And after you complete your basic uh, base level of physician builder certification, you are eligible to take advanced courses, including courses that teach you how to que query your local enterprise data warehouse for data. Um, of course, whether you're allowed to or not depends on your local governance. But then there's, um, I believe, um, value to be able to understand how that data is structured in the back end to inform a better data request. I will note, as somebody who has gone through this program, and someone who leads, um, helps um, recruit individuals for this program at Children's Healthcare Atlanta, these programs provide minimal training in informatics science and theory. In other words, the, this is skills oriented. It doesn't teach, it teach you how to build, but it doesn't teach you what you should build and what you shouldn't build. Um, although they do provide a little bit of um, uh, a training there, it's very minimal. So that's what we're talking about um, when we're talking about Epic's uh, Physician Builder Program. And um, Cerner has a similar program, as I mentioned. Now, when I recruit individuals to, uh, to get you certified, these are the things I talk about. For individuals who might be interested, why might you want to participate? I think it tends to target individuals who are interested in fixing problems themselves, or they're interested in fixing problems for their partners. We struggle with collecting data for this. I also always need to report on that. This pop-up is always in my way. This order set is not optimized. I want to fix it. And it's causing burnout. Um, some people are, like the challenge of doing clinical work and then switching over to doing uh, EHR build work. And it could be a, a opportunity for career advancement in the service track and leadership track for individuals who participate in this. For some individuals, they're actually interested in exploring a career where in clinical informatics might play a role in that. And, this provides them an on-ramp, a fairly easy on-ramp to explore informatics. Again, no cost to them and fairly um, uh, doable classes. Each class is usually about three days long. So it's like a 10-year conference rather than uh, not as, and so a lower level commitment than like a master's degree, for example. I would say there's also benefits for your clinical divisions because you have somebody who's already part of your group that is already part of your team who now has additional knowledge and skills and access to the EHR team to be able to include things for your group. And whereas previously you submit a ticket for a bill request to fix something and you wait, now you may have somebody who can actually fix a problem 
uh, without having to wait for your, your, your problem to come up on the queue. And the goal is hopefully to be able to improve your care processes, improve patient outcomes, and improve especially clinician satisfaction to prevent burnout. And for IT groups and informaticists, um, you have a built-in liaison who serves as a champion and as an expert collaborator, somebody who you can work with to make improvements in an area that not only knows the clinical problems, but has some understanding of what you're actually able to do with your AEHR, not just an imagination of what should be able to be should be able to be done. And we all know that IT departments are stretched. There's much more demand for IT services than there are supply, particularly on the people, um, and human resources part. So having giving the clinicians ability to fix some of the problems themselves actually expands the, the, your manpower. Um, and it overall increases uh, user satisfaction with your EHR um, and the reach of your EHR optimization across institution. So the, I believe this is the ideal phenotype for somebody who might want to be interested in this type of program. It might be a clinician with deep awareness of their local clinical workflows, issues, and priorities. So generally speaking, it tends to be somebody who has a more clinical um, uh, work, clinical job, rather than a researcher in a lab. They know, they take care of patients and they know what's the problem that they're dealing with. They have an interest or aptitude in technology, research, and clinical data. And they ha either have an interest in quality improvement or process improvement or patient safety, or alternatively, they have an interest in, in clinical research. They deal with uh, clinical data all the time uh, for reporting, and they have a need to support the workflow to support clinical research. They have a service mindset, building not just for themselves, but for their group. They have prior experience collaborating with IT. And this last part is extremely important. They're not lone wolves, but their work is well aligned with their local, departmental, and also the institutional priorities. The institution is interested in increasing access to patients, decreasing uh, wait time, you know, appointment times. And then now we have a clinician who is now also interested in that, working together to fix that problem. And that person is not voluntold to do this, but is actually part of their uh, personal career goals in uh, professional development. So now I'm going to transition to keep providing you a case study from um, Children's Healthcare Atlanta. The purpose of this part of the talk is not to toot our own horns, but just to describe a real world uh, um, a, a hospital that's actually doing this to provide a vision for what could be done perhaps if there's an interest to develop such a program at UAB or Children's of Alabama. So very small uh, background. Um, we initially implemented EPIC in 2008, so quite a long time ago and achieved level seven or stage seven designation in 2017. We only launched the Provider Builder Program in 2020. So uh, it's only been the last three years. So uh, everything you see here is achievable um, at either healthcare institutions uh, within a short amount of time. We're a young program. And Children's uh, of Atlanta's Provider Builder Program, our purpose is to develop experts in clinical workflows plus EHR capabilities or it into clinical teams in order to maximize the impact of EHR optimization. We believe that uh, the EHR can do more for you and if we're, it's well optimized, but we don't have the opportunity to optimize everything everywhere. And so if you can develop these clinicians who know the local problem and they have the ability to fix it, then we can maximize the benefits throughout the institution. And our big, hairy, audacious goal is to um, be able to train up at least one certified physician or APP builder out of 75% of all of our clinical specialties. And I would say that's a pretty challenging goal to achieve, but that's the goal that we set up for ourselves um, when we started the program. So the first part of our program is what we call Geek Squad. Um, Geek Squad has, is one of those acronyms where we created something on the back end to make it fit. And so it stands for Graduate Medical Education EHR Coding Squad. Initially, it had a focus on fellows and uh, physicians, but now it has kind of grown uh, broader than that. This is the interest group, um, and it's all volunteers. Um, it's open to physicians, including trainees, APPs, medical students, and other clinicians who have an interest in EHR build and informatics as well. We provide them uh, access to EPIC training, the training I already described previously directly from EPIC, 
but we supplement that with a monthly reading. As I mentioned earlier, Epic teaches you how to what to build, but not no, they teach you how to build, but not what to build and what not to build. And so we supplement um, by providing clinical informatics didactic UX. And we also provide local uh, issues or configurations. So Epic teaches you, you know, Epic Foundation standard build, and we teach you, well, at Children's of Atlanta, this is the situation here. At lunch in 2020, there were five certified individuals in our entire institution, and the membership roles for Geek Squad was 21 individuals. Three years later, actually two and a half years later, we have 35 certified individuals throughout, the, uh, and this is physicians and APPs only. Um, and our membership role has grown to 119. Showing you that there is interest within your, um, your professional staff in this type of program. So here are examples of the topics that we covered in the last year. So it's not a formalized curriculum, but we try to cover topics um, that we feel will be important for all of our builders to know. And so uh, here are our topics from our actual calendar from last year. And our 2023 focus, we decided to focus on documentation burden. You know, there's an opportunity to revise our notes with the new MPM changes. Um, and also, you know, with AMU 25 and 5, with an emphasis on reducing documentation burden, we thought it was a great time to make that our uh, year goal for our entire program. And so our 2023 calendar focuses on that, including uh, guest speakers from other institutions, in particular uh, 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 education on um, how can we reduce documentation where existing technology, not necessarily future technology that we don't have access to yet. So I wanna take this moment to highlight an example of a bill that one of our Geek Squad members did. And so Ben Siegel, I love um, this, um, you know, tuning his horn wherever I go. Ben Siegel, he was a fellow. He was a child neurology fellow um, at Children's Healthcare Atlanta. Um, and he wanted to fix how we give benzodiazepine or fix our treatment of patients with status epilepticus, a dangerous condition where a patient comes in with continuous seizures. He, as a child neuro, neuro fellow, uh, saw that, you know, the emergency room was pretty good with giving the first line drug, an Ativan, for example. But if it doesn't work, they were not good with giving the second line drug, a non-benzodiazepine. There were national guidelines for when you should give that drug, and we were not achieving it. So he, in uh, under the uh, mentorship of our CMIO, uh, was able to um, develop measures to identify what is, let's quantify the problem and how do we know our changes and improvement. So let's start measuring problem of the process right now. Let's develop SQL code for, uh, you know, into, in our EDW so we can actually track what is our current problem with this and can we measure to see if we're making improvement. And then he uh, revised our, uh, the neurology console note uh, templates um, to be able to capture the denominator of patients who are in status because we knew that our existing data, uh, that was not well captured in our existing data. So whenever a patient gets a neural consult is for status, uh, the, uh, the resident clicks that button and then we, now we have a denominator. He recognized that it was not just fixing the order set, we had to actually change our institutional clinical practice guidelines. So he convened the emergency room, child neurology, all of the um, various different uh, stakeholders to revise our hospital guidelines. And after that difficult work was done, then he went on and uh, fixed the order set. So notice his work was not just, I think we need a better order set, let's fix it, let's change it. It was the entire process. Um, and uh, so, that's what a, a, a resident could do uh, under mentorship uh, through this program. And I, uh, you know, I see your question. I will come back to this um, uh, later on. So that's Geek Squad. That's the first component of our training program. And now I'll introduce a, in a new program we added on top of that, a new layer called the Provider Builder Leadership Program. This was launched last year to as extension of Geek Squad. We thought that uh, you know, to improve our key squad, we want to develop a, another layer, a formal leadership development program. The goals of this uh, leadership program was to increase the number of people certified, the diversity of people certified, including gender diversity, you know, uh, social, uh, uh, 
a, um, SDOH type of uh, diversity. We wanted to increase our specialty representation because we recognize it tend to be like hospitalists who are doing this. We need more surgeons. Um, and we want to be able to have a formal way of upscaling the skills. Um, Geek Squad is a voluntary program. This program is a mentored program with expectations. A want to focus on permanent staff at Children's, attendings and APPs, knowing that our residents and fellows will eventually leave us. So it includes Geek Squad plus one-on-one -on -one mentorship with a physician informaticist on a monthly basis. And we provide partial FT support from central IT for a time limited basis for the 12 months of the program. So we receive approval for one FTE. We split that one FTE across our cohort. So everyone received 0.1 FTE um, commensurate with their uh, existing salary. Some receive additional divisional matching to have additional time to become uh, in the training program. It was a competitive selection process, and the selection process required both a personal application describing why they're interested in the leadership program, what they're trying to accomplish through it, and require a division director letter of support. Because like I said earlier, alignment between uh, the goals of the individual and their uh, divisions and departments is critically important for the success of these individuals. So we were sure when we launched the program how many people would apply. Well, we get five applications. We received 27, uh, much more than we expected. And we were able to select 14 individuals to be in the program. Basically, we selected the maximum number of people that we have funding for, and we had the ability to mentor. Those 14 individuals in our initial leadership cohort include 11 attendings and three APPs across a wide variety of specialties, both the ones you expect, like hospice medicine, as well as things like orthopedics cardiothoracic surgery, interventional radiology, even radiology, you know, radiology, emergency medicine. So we were able to achieve this goal of getting more diversity in the specialties that were represented because we wanted to achieve optimization across the entire institution. So quickly describing the impact of this leadership program specifically, out of a cohort of 14, 13 are now certified. Now three came in, came in already certified, so that, you know, that's not fair. But 10 were certified in the last year after joining the program, and the program only started in August. Uh, three individuals received advanced certifications. So analytics is a bit more advanced certification. Healthy planets is advanced, and especially uh, application is more advanced. So we're seeing the success where if there is a mentorship program, a leadership program overlay, people have the um, ability to get through the training program. Four, 10 of these individuals are now serving in uh, various different committees, uh, one on decision support governance, and the other committee is our data analytics governance. Um, and below are some examples of the actual operational uh, projects that these individuals are leading throughout our institution, from uh, note revisions to decision support tools to building clinical registries for um, you know, health population management to improving order sets. And this is the growth of our program in the last three years. You can see um, when the program was launched uh, 2020, we have five certified builders. And through a formal program, we were able to increase that um, over the years. And the leadership program launched in August of 2022. And this sharp increase of certification, I believe is directly re uh, related to this leadership program. We now have 35 certified builders. We have now reached 20 of 47 specialties, 43% of all specialties at Children's Healthcare Atlanta, with our goal of reaching 75. And here are examples of um, specialties are represented. Critical care um, is now five certified, including two attendees and one APP. Um, and one fellow who certifies interested in pursuing a Concord Max fellowship, uh, with this program being a, uh, a taste, an appetizer for what an uh, informaticist might do. So these programs, I hope to convince you, are a form of workforce development. There are insufficient number of clinical pharmacists to meet workforce needs. And these health programs help develop existing clinicians that are in your hospitals, already seeing patients, into many informaticists. They serve as operational force multipliers and ambassadors for the informatics program, for IT. And they increase CI's reach throughout the institution. 
these programs, if they exist, should be part of a formal CI training program. So if you have a CI fellowship, I believe that they should be certified as builders. Um, ideally, if you have a master's degree or a PhD, that those individuals also have exposure, um, although paying for these training programs is tricky because they're expensive for non-physicians. Um, and for these individuals, it becomes part of the career development. Some considerations though, these training programs are not the equivalent of formal CI training. I would not say that this is the same as a CI fellowship or a master's degree or a certificate program because CI uh, or program, provided program programs focus on how to build, not what to build or the theory. You still have to supplement with theory. These programs are limited by time. You know, clinicians are limited in time. If you're if you're interested, you still have to find time to get certified. And if there's not a T support, how are you gonna find time in between seeing patients and research and whatnot to be able to, to invest three days at a time, three times, three different conferences to get certified. And that's a limiting factor to getting people certified. If you have a protected time, protected FTE model, who pays for it? Does IT pay for it? Does a division pay for it? You can argue both ways. You know, they're part of IT, so IT should pay for it. Or no, they're optimizing things for the, the Hemonk division. Hemonk should um, have some, um, you know, skin in the game. How does it make sense to take so many clinicians out of clinical care when there's already shortage of clinicians? So you have to balance institutional priorities. When is it, um, when is it um, relevant? When does it make sense? How much? A clinical time doesn't make sense to remove so that these people can get it, get certified and make an impact because their impact is not just for themselves but for everyone. So perhaps they could improve efficiency for everyone at the cost of their own productivity, clinical productivity. So that requires you know institutional prioritization and alignment. And for individuals who are you know private groups that are you know have an appointment at your local hospital, Stark law might be an issue if you are trying to in, uh, reimburse them for their service in this area. So um, now briefly, I want to speak to this idea of a maturity model. Uh, uh, where you might start from and where might, you might get to. So uh, starting with planting the seed. Um, so this is a model we presented at AMIA Symposium last year. And planting the seed may be where you have no builders uh, currently. Uh, um, and IT may not have um, um, awareness of a program like this or may be reluctant to support such a program. The next step might be to identify champions and well-qualified individuals to be um, and start organizing who might be a good candidate for such a program. Make sure it's well aligned with what institution is interested in and uh, there's a need for support and sponsorship from high level decision makers. Maybe it's the CMI, CMO, maybe it's the CHIO, maybe it's the, um, a department head that sees the vision for something like this. Then uh, next level is lone wolves, where there may be a few uh, builders working independently in the areas, but there's not a program. They're not sharing knowledge. They're not collaborating together. And so the next step for that would be to build your cadre of um, builders and start developing a community of practice. And then finally, developing the community practice. Um, so you now have greater than five individuals, mostly volunteers. Now let's create a program. Let's establish access procedures instead of the one-off. If you're certified and you achieve these um, criteria, you're allowed to build, for example. And let's share our, let's start developing, you know, let's share our builds with each other, learn from each other. If you're at this stage, perhaps the next step is to create a mentorship structure. Um, start, you know, keeping track of your progress and your impact. Um, and start providing local educational material and didactic conferences um, to supplement what uh, uh, EPIC is providing. Oftentimes, initial builders will already be somebody with Infinax interest or expertise. And there might, if you want to recruit more, you might have to start providing didactics or education. Stage three is organizational structure, um, developing and formalizing your standards for how to get protected time and how um, this program will be measured for success. Um, how will you integrate with the local IT shop? Um, and maybe you start expanding your training offerings from basic build to now more advanced things like analytics or um, population management or registry creation or even 
a SQL or EDW type of work. Um, you can start expanding your education offerings. Stage four, we describe as Jetta Council, which is we have now many builders. Um, you have now defined levels of access and skills. You have structured knowledge sharing, and you have a tracking system for your builds. Um, and so this part may be engaging in leadership about, okay, we're starting to get a group. We're starting to be like a um, rapid respond, response group. How can we um, make sure that, that we uh, the institution values the contributions of these builders? Um, and to make sure that they get protected time so that they can be effective. And finally, informatics in the room where it happens, where there is a uh, mature program with informaticists and builders working together with the IT shop, with your um, um, informaticists on the IT side to work together to develop that uh, vision for healthcare transformation. Um, and also talk about integration with formalized training programs. Sometimes there's a formalized training program before you have a builder program, Sometimes you have a builder program first before you have a formalized training program, and the conversation is about the integrating the two. So um, I went backwards, I apologize. So here's my take-home slide. Um, I hope I convinced you that there's a need for informatics workforce development programs to achieve the vision of healthcare transformation, and that provider program, builder programs serve a need not um, at the middle portion for individuals or clinicians to upscale their ability to do basic uh, things related to informatics and data science for non-expert, uh, non-informatics expert clinicians. These individuals can serve as force multipliers for clinical informatics and improve EHR optimization across the entire institution. I, um, a formalized leadership program with FTU support can really help um, uh, grow this program as impact. Notice that the entire commitment from central IT funding was 1.0 FTE. We just split that up across individuals uh, and we decided to not invest in longitudinal sustaining support, but invested in, in leadership development to get you through certification and get you through initial training. Um, and a provider building maturity model can be used to guide program development. Uh, thank you so much for your attend attention. Um, you see my contact information there below, and now I'm happy to um, to answer any questions that you may have. And I see uh, Dr. Berner wrote in the chat, what interest have you seen in participants pursuing more formal informatics education after completing this program? Also, does this program count for the credentials for the clinical informatics subspecialty, or do they need more formal training? Um, so a great question. I think that especially for our trainees, for our residents and fellows, Many of them are using this to explore a career uh, to receive more formal informatics education. Now, as somebody who received formal informatics education through the master's degree, postdoctoral fellowship type of pathway, I would say that I wished I got this type of certification training as part of my master's degree. I learned a lot of theory. I didn't learn a lot of practical uh, EHR build. And while we might, um, we might look down on just focusing on build, I think it's an essential part of a, a holistic informatics training in a formal training pathway. So from the point of view of clinicians, yes, many of them are now exploring, how can I now formally transition this area? Whether for informatics to be a continuous small part of my career, 20% of my time, or I want to go now do a CI fellowship, or I now want to do a master's degree. And then, yeah, and then also for those who are interested in CI fellowships or master's degrees, we try to get them into these programs and get them as much training as they can um, early on in their career. What about uh, Amy, uh, Dr. Wan asks, what about contributing towards experience practice time for CI practice pathway? Yes, builders, um, if they have sufficient time building, it certainly counts towards uh, you know, sitting for the uh, CI boards um, uh, through the practice pathway. But I would say this alone by itself is not sufficient. Um, it could be a component of it. So I think you need to have sufficient FTE, you know, committed towards uh, informatics, but you probably need deeper experience and expertise, more than just um, epic training, if you will, to, to I, in my point of view, um, uh, to be able to sit for the, that pathway. So we're not, um, uh, some of our individuals are pursuing that, but they have operational roles in our hospital. Um, and our, for the average person doing this program, um, they would not qualify, in my opinion. Dr. Elsef asks, 
it appears you did not use physician builder during, builders during the initial epic implementation. If that was the case, is there a reason not to recruit physicians APPs to help it out with the initial implementation and build? Great question. So part of the, I was not there for the, uh, for the implementation. So I'll describe what my understanding will happen. For any EPIC implementation, this is specific to EPIC, they do recruit uh, a cadre of individuals who serve as champions. Um, back during the time when Children of Atlanta implemented EPIC, I don't know if they had a um, requirement for these individuals to be certified. So there was a cohort individual who took classes and went to EPIC and took classes in person and they became the local experts in build and were champions, but they did not necessarily get certified. And they did not necessarily continue having an operational role within the hospital and get um, in certification. So while when we started, we uh, at some point, we only had two individuals who were certified. Who was a CMIO and uh, another, another individual who got certified as part of a CI fellowship at a different hospital who was recruited as faculty at the hospital. Other people had some um, training, but not certification and did not have build access. So I do think it's an excellent strategy to have a, a cadre of physicians and APPs to get formal certification as part of implementation. I do think that is important. And Emory University, uh, uh, who recently went live with Epic, that's what they're doing. They have a group, they have recruited a group of, of clinicians and they're going through certification, but their certification is not required to be a champion, but the champions are now getting certified, if that makes sense. Um, and I see that Dr. Wong answered um, Hope's question. Um, so Dr. Wong asked, great record of builders continuing informatics leadership, even careers. Other feedback from participants, formal and informal. Great. So, for, so far we have received only informal qualitative feedback. We are developing a framework to receive formal evaluation of the program. Um, the program is relatively new, it's, you know, started off as an interest group and this, uh, the leadership program was only developed, it's not even a year old. Um, and so some of the data that you saw with the impact of the leadership program are brand new high off the press data that we have received. And so we do want to incorporate a formal um, uh, evaluation process for the participants so that we can continue to improve our educational offerings. Great. Other questions that uh, individuals may have for this. Hey Wayne, it's Matthew. Uh, yes. Nice very nice talk. I was curious about, so like with this builder programs, what is the time commitment on a physician? Like you said, they're already busy with their, their clinical work. You know, it's nice to get certified, but you know, is that something where they go away for a week and do these, these uh, classes or is it they take one hour per week over like a nine month period, um, just a sense of what, what entails. Yes, uh, the, fantastic. So EPIC certification, I've estimated uh, for basic physician builder certification, I estimated the time requirement to be 80 hours total. So how that looks, what that looks like is there are three classes you have to take in order. Each class is taught um, over a series of days. And it's like an intensive. So I think of it like attending three conferences. The first one is two, uh, is one and a half days um, from like nine, from 8.30 to six. Um, you can take it completely virtually by Zoom. Um, and so you don't have to go to Wisconsin. Um, uh, you can do it at home, um, but you need to have that time off to be able to take the classes. They'll usually offer once a month. So you need to be able to, you know, the hardest part is actually finding time uh, protected time to do the, that, you know, not being in clinic, not seeing patients. So for the one and a half days, you're in class, um, is taught live, and then after the class is over, you do a project, which is completing a homework assignment that usually takes about 10 hours to complete. So total time commitment for the first class is about two and a half days. And it's not one hour at a time, you have to be in class those one and a half days, uh, and then dedicated 10 hours. After you get the first class done and you pass it, you take the next class, which is two and a half hours. Um, plus 10 hours of a project. And then the third class, two and a half, sorry, I meant to say two and a half days plus 10 more hours for a project. And then the third class, two and a half days plus 10 hours for a project. So many individuals, including attendings who are busy clinicians, have gotten certified. Um, yes, and they are CME. They have gotten certified on their own volunteer time or their administrative time. 
But we recognize the biggest challenge is finding a protected time because um, you got to get people to cover for you, you know, for clinic or whatnot or cancel clinic. And that's why I developed the leadership program. Full month program will provide the FT support, will buy some of your time so that you can then arrange for the three days you'll be away three times in that year to get certified. Thankfully, once you pass a class, it doesn't expire. So you could do it as slow as you would like. But I, really, I recommend a certification to happen within six months to 12 months because it's very hard to pick up where you even took the class a year ago. It's hard to pick up with the next class. The total time commitment is less than a master's degree, but it's intensive and it's not, uh, it, it is not easy, but it's very doable for anyone. Um, and I'm happy to describe that more in detail if you like. But I would say the biggest challenge is just like planning to go on a conference. Same, that's the same challenge. How am I going to be able to leave that week for three days to be able to take the class? Um, and uh, Dr. Wan asked about uh, CME. Yes, you get CME through the University of Wisconsin for that. Um, and you asked about representation, and it, that's exactly right. So if you focus on a those who are willing to participate and have, a protected, uh, have the ability to do it, you're naturally going to have um, heavy representation in some areas and less in some other areas. So part of our provider builder leadership program is to uh, directly pay for those individuals in the less represented programs. So we are we do have a focus on building up our primary care. We have a focus on building our, our urgent care. Um, we have a focus on building up more surgeons, um, more proceduralists in our institution. Uh, Curtis asks, um, was the IT, ITFT recruited internally or externally? Hire to hire someone who can communicate well at WebMDs or they fully utilize overwork award? All of these recruitments were internal. So basically, uh, a physician or APP already at an institution could apply to join the leadership program with the support of their division director or their department head with the knowledge that the agreement that they would free up protected time for them to join the leadership program. And we would then we would provide them with 0.1 FTE that scaled to their existing pay. So we did pay people different amounts. Um, that's the decision that we made because we want to make sure people go whole. Um, so um, if it weren't for the divisional support aspect, it would not be successful. And then I had to go through a, a formal approval process through our hospital medical director appointment process so that we can make sure that uh, it doesn't take away from the RVU calculations. And the divisions knew that these physicians no longer having, you know, having 0.1 less of clinical time might impact their ability to achieve the incentives. And they still say yes to those individuals. Uh, Dr. Cutney has a hand raised. There's a follow-up question on, um, I was wondering if you looked at sort of the trickle-down effect of this. So if, if not everyone can commit to that certification and then the ongoing support that you're, you're doing, but I can imagine, you know, someone who's interested in clinical research is that these people embedded within the division are then helping and empowering other faculty who want to create, um, you know, QI metrics or do certain queries who wouldn't have been able to do that without some direct support. Um, so have you seen how, how these people now who are certified and skilled are helping people within their division to accomplish that sort of clinical research? Yes, so that's excellent. I think being able to demonstrate the impact is very challenging, but very important. You know, I always uh, advise my, the, the, the people in the program, if you can find a financial ROI, you should definitely communicate that. Um, can we measure the amount of time your colleagues are spending writing notes? And if you can track that over time and find reduction, which we can use with analytics data, you can translate that into a ROI, a financial ROI. But um, oftentimes, financial ROI is not what drives positions, or especially in academia, and often it's hard to measure. So we look at things like satisfaction. We ask them to use stories, you know, talk about what you're accomplishing and what impact. Do something that uh, people can see what you're doing, and they can feel the impact. And so that your division director knows that this is actually really something really important for us to continue to support, even if I can't measure it quantitatively. But you're exactly right. If your division is interested in data for reporting or for research, you need somebody who understands your needs to be able to build that data capture tool that, um, so that you can report later. And so um, can you measure that? Can you, you can at least say in the past, we were spending this much time in chart review for this information. Now we run a report. Um, that's a financial story. That's a documentation. That's a um, reducing 
you know, burden on your chart reviewers, that's um, increasing your throughput to research. Um, it might be more story oriented, but that's critically important. I see we have ten, two minutes left. So um, if there are there any final questions? Yeah, I have a quick question. Yes. Uh, Wayne, first of all, let me say thank you very much uh, for doing this. We really miss you. Um, you know, I don't know if you heard the rumors, but there's serious discussion that we uh, will be getting epic here. So I heard uh, that. <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll need to have you come back uh, That's not presented. <laughs> as a consultant or something. Uh -huh. uh, but thank you very much for doing this. Sorry I couldn't be in person. And um, yeah, my question is, do you see a place for sub 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 specialties in, in clinical informatics? Do you mean as builders or as so so a sub so a subspecialty? We've got a clinical informatics subspecialty oh. now. So a subspecialty of that, oh. you know, laboratory, ICU, you know, um, oh, pathology. Okay. Is it is there enough, you know, that we need to be doing uh, more specialized uh, training? Well, um, I think that uh, de facto people are becoming sub specialized. I would probably err away from requiring board certification in a SESA specialty. I mean, there's just so many boards you can take. And I, if I had to take four board, I don't know why I would do. But I naturally focus my uh, expertise in TMONC, BMT informatics for obvious reasons in pediatrics. So I do think that there is, especially in academics, there is a need to specialize in an area. Some people do more research informatics and others do more clinical. And that's important. Um, but there's a need to develop, um, you know, from an AMIA point of view, collaboration between AMIA, APINA, the with like the the Society for Internal Medicine or the Society for PT Monk, and developing cadres of people who are focusing on the problems in that specialty. That's why I think is the way to go, and recognizing that these people bring value, even if they're not like a board certification. Okay, thank you. Um, I just have a quick question: Is this? Um... Is this something that that this model with the leadership is this something that you've instituted, or is this something that's occurring widespread or being promoted by Epic? Um, the leadership program was something I led here. I I developed and led here, um, and the provider builder leadership, uh, the provider builder program itself is Epic wide, but the leadership program model was something that we came up with at Children's Healthcare Alliance, and the the concept was uh, limited dollars, time limited investment in individuals. To get more people certified, I was about to type in another question: that how do you get how do you get this funding, and how do you get the buy-in from the departments and divisions? It's a new thing, and everybody's tight with their dollars, especially when they take take people away from from uh, RVUs. Yes, the money came from us allow. So we got a certain amount of money to hire physician informaticists. We decided to not hire 1.0 of T equivalent of informaticists in order to use the same money to split up across 14 individuals. For to um, uh, for the, the development program, thinking that that will give us more impact over time. So, and there's always a risk of the funding going away. You're exactly right. But this is money that our CIO committed to us. Okay. Well, hopefully there'll be other um, other funding programs. Don't want to necessarily take away time from informaticists. Well, I know that we're at time. I know you're a busy doing all busy person doing all these things. Any final you know final uh, final answer or final question before we let you go? Well, um, if not, hearing none, then uh, thank you for a wonderful talk. Very um, practical, and I, you know, you really covered all the bases, and you know, very, um, you know, practical, but also, you know, backed up by evidence and, and good practice. So, um, uh, your contact information is there in case anybody wants to contact you. We are establishing a department, so you know that might be, you know, maybe we can have you get involved more that way. Well, beyond, we're not just going to be just an institute anymore. But, uh, but anyway, thanks everybody. Uh, thank you for attending and for the great questions. Have a great weekend and we'll hope to see you at the next Power Talk. Take care, everyone. Bye.